When you think of spies, you probably imagine secret codes and information drops, targeting the highest echelons of the British state. But away from the glamorous world of James Bond, things are changing. Intelligence officials are particularly worried about Russia, which is moving away from spying on politicians to trying to disrupt the fabric of British society itself. Welcome to the I Podcast. This week, we're joined by senior reporter Richard Holmes, and later we'll be hearing from Chris Steele, the former intelligence officer who authored the Steele dossier about what Russia is attempting and what can be done about it. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for joining us. Firstly, as someone who has written quite extensively about espionage, How does, from your perspective, the myth and the reality compare here? Well, there's often, when you're talking about espionage and and sort of spying, there's a natural tendency to walk into the myth and the sexiness of that. And the truth is, if you look at some of the cases in the past, you've got people being poisoned with the tips of umbrellas, smothering fatal doses of, of radiation around London, and planting deadly toxins on people's front doors. That's not myth. They're all instances that have happened in the past, and they've happened at the hands of Russian spies. And so you can see why people confuse the two, because all those those examples have seem fit for a John le Carre novel. But, you know, there's obviously going to be over-dramatization with myths, and, you know, when people start getting rolling with theories, and especially with conspiracies on the internet, you can see where that starts to go down a dangerous road. But, yeah, I mean, certainly... The nature of espionage and and spying has to be imaginative and creative, so you can certainly see elements where the two cross over, but it's important to distinguish between the two. So in terms of an actor like Russia, what are they trying to gain when they spy or have covert intelligence activities within the UK, for example? Any state, and particularly Russia, is looking to gain any sort of information that can't be obtained through other routes, you know, legally or through diplomatic talks. Espionage is there to sort of fill in the vast grey area and intelligence picture. And that could be by using, you know, intelligence officers who are trained to gather intelligence and, you know, sniff around for secrets or agents who are, in essence, human sources of intelligence officers. And they are motivated by political desires, money, ideology, and they're also in place to sort of gather that grey area of, of intel and ultimately benefit the state they're working for. Now, it sounds like some of Russia's intelligence gathering activity is sort of changing in motivation. So it's becoming a bit less targeted and a bit more aimed at kind of wholesale disruption. What can you tell us that you've kind of learned from your reporting on this? Well, when I started reporting on on this area back in around 2016, we had the newest elections and when there was a wide amount of, of speculation around Russia's involvement in that and interfering in an election, which seemed totally new for the time. And as we can see, as things have progressed a little bit more, we can see that they've gone from that sort of targeted approach to, you know, they're now very much, since the war in Ukraine, this rogue state that everyone is sort of wary of. And I, I imagine that's made targeted intelligence attacks much harder because they've put themselves on everyone's radar. And with the sanctions that are being imposed in the West, it's it's much harder to have a sort of underlying presence in the countries they're interested in. And so what you're seeing is, yeah, like you said, a, a very wide approach to intelligence gathering. And, you know, we've had in the past six months, we've had arrests in US, Sweden, Norway, Germany and the UK of both intelligence officers and agents who have been just trying to gather intelligence from from high standing places in, in Western governments. It's the ever-changing approach when you have a country that's now in hot war rather than an underlying cold war. So how is that kind of activity changing over time? Yeah, so I mean, in the past, spies have died. You know, we've had a string of assassinations in the West, which intelligence officials believe to be at the hands of the Russian state or 
organised crime, which the two often do work alongside each other. What we can see about the arrests recently, though, is, you know, for example, the um, British employee at the um, British embassy in, in Germany. He was just a security guard who was going through locked filing cabinets at night. We've seen people at universities in Norway being arrested. And recently in the US, there was a spy who pretended to be a Brazilian student called Victor Ferreira, who tried to get employed at The Hague where we know recently Vladimir Putin's facing charges, which he'll probably never face. And you see recently with the arrest of the Wall Street Journal journalist Evan Gershkovich, they're still pretty good at their old tricks. They're just trying to diversify. Richard, we're going to hear now from Chris Steele, whose name might be familiar to some of our listeners. Where might they know him from? So Chris Steele is a former MI6 intel officer, and he was head of the Russia desk at MI6. He has since left MI6, and people will be aware of his work. He authored the 2016 Steele dossier, which made a number of allegations around Donald Trump's links with Russian state and interference in the US election. The reason he he wrote that dossier and was at the forefront of that dossier is because of his vast experience with Russian state activity. And we spoke to him about this threat. I'm Christopher Steele. I spent 22 years working in foreign policy and intelligence in the British government. And in that time, I did postings in in Moscow and Paris. And towards the end of my career, became really one of the HMG's leading specialist experts on Russia and Central Eurasia, and one of the top briefers in those subjects. And and by trade and intelligence professional. What do you see as the current threat posed by the Russian state and Russian intelligence to the UK? I think the threat that Russia poses to the UK is a very diverse one. Traditionally, of course, we were looking mainly at the Russian state and its sort of declared actors in the main. There were, of course, some illegal operations going as well where People were living amongst us with false identities. But essentially, it was a state-driven operation. Its targets were mainly concerned with political life. There were some scientific and technical acquisition targets as well. But it was a fairly well-defined and limited scope, I think, in terms of what they were trying to obtain in the UK by clandestine means. I think that has changed quite considerably. And it's not so much an issue of passive collection anymore and acquisition of information. It's as much a case of using that information, using contacts indeed, to sort of weaken and divide our society in a broader sense than just politics, in a broader sense than just military matters. And it represents a sort of vista, if you like, of a quite wide range of threats, anything from discrediting our elections and our democracy to stealing our nuclear secrets and everything in between. And in terms of those threats to democracy and our internal securities and secrets, what are the sort of range of activities that Russian agencies are involved with inside the UK or on UK soil? I think they're very broad. I mean, clearly the Russian state representatives working out of the embassy and other official bodies continue the traditions of Russian intelligence, the Soviet intelligence before them. And as I say, they're mainly targeting political and economic secrets, military secrets, and some scientific and technical ones. But I think beyond that, you have a whole vista of influence operations that's developed in the last 20, 25 years, which is everything from getting money into campaigns to political parties through donations, influencing policymaking, and not just towards Russia or the former Soviet states but also towards our allies. And I think, I think that's the area which has grown the most and has is, is not been combated as effectively as it might have been. And we don't even have, for example, a Foreign Agent Registration Act in this country, which means that you are perfectly legally able to work secretly for the Russian government and, and to carry out its objectives and its policies without any fear, really, of, of, of certainly judicial retribution. Obviously, in the past year, With the situation that's developed in Ukraine, the public's perception to the threat that Russia poses has been somewhat enlightened on a broader scale. 
But do you think the threat of Russia in the UK has changed in that past year? And and do you think there's been a diversification of that threat in the backdrop of the war in Ukraine? I don't think the threat has fundamentally changed. I mean, I think the Russian government, being one at war, of course, um, is probably more prepared to take bigger risks in its intelligence operations against the UK than it would have been in peacetime when they had greater equities in their bilateral relationship with our government. But I think it's also become in some ways more difficult. The Russian bear has been exposed to be what it is, which is a brutal lying and killing machine, which is intent on imperial conquest on the European continent. And I suspect that they are having a lot of trouble not only keeping their own folks loyal to to their regime, their own intelligence operatives and officers, but indeed trying to recruit Brits and finding motivation in British people to help them along their way. Do you think the UK pre-war was doing enough to deal with that threat? And after the war, do you think that realisation and public perception of this country that now, you know, everyone knows to be this bad actor, do you think the UK has now adjusted its defence to that threat and is doing enough post-war as well? No, I think these challenges are generational. And one of the problems has been that in the period after 9-11, when the focus of resources and intelligence work was put upon counterterrorism, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, etc., is that, in a sense, our capabilities and expertise and knowledge withered on the vine. It takes 15, 20 years, I believe, to build up those sort of capabilities and get that sort of experience back into government. So we're probably quite well behind the curve at the moment. So, Richard, what sense did you get from your conversation with Chris about the nature of the threat from Russia? What was obvious from from talking with Chris is that Russia is very much a, a state that is fighting for something it's not really sure what it's fighting for. It's severed all its international ties and it's fully become this rogue state, which is trying to just gather as much information as it can through the use of statecraft and inflict as much interference on the West as it possibly can. I'm quite interested in Chris as a person. What does he do now? Is there a a market for the private spying sector? There's a huge market for the the private spying Spy for hire type situation? (laughs) Almost. I mean, every facet and every of, of our society and every industry can benefit from private investigations. It's an area that's that's rarely touched on, to be honest, in the media. But yeah, I mean, you know, these skills that intelligence officers pick up in, you know, gathering information and being able to attract covert sources and, you know, build relationships with people, they are very beneficial, not only to private organizations, but, you know, governments and um, states can use them as well. Um, And they, they have done in the past where certain jobs are slightly tricky for states to officially get into. There is definitely a market there for for private organisations. Now, I'm not saying Chris has done any of that himself, but there is definitely a booming industry, especially in this country and in London, for private investigations. And and it's always going to be there as far as I'm concerned. Richard's reporting on the threat from states like Russia has been crucial in exposing their intelligence efforts in the UK. If you'd like to support the important work from Richard and our other award-winning reporters, consider taking out a subscription. For more coverage of this and other news, go to inews.co.uk forward slash podcast and get 30% off a digital subscription to i. I for Open Minds. Subscribe today. Richard, we've talked a lot about Russia today, but it's obviously not going to be the only country that MI6 has got eyes on. I'm thinking particularly of other states like China. How does Russia's approach to espionage perhaps differ from other countries? Well, certainly since the invasion of Ukraine last year, Russia, on a global scale, is not a peer. It's a rogue nation which is well-armed and seeks to subvert the international order of things. Whereas China is a peer and a competitor, 
that wants to shape the international order of things and can is aspire to one day dominate the international order of things. Both countries seek to alter the status quo as far as the West is concerned, but at the moment only Russia has invaded its neighbours, assassinated its opponents, interfered in foreign elections and works to undermine the West. And so I think that makes Russia a more immediate threat to the West and to the UK, but it does not ignore the fact that China is more of a long-term challenge for us. And what have you uncovered about China? Because there was some amazing work that you did on some very shady covert Chinese activities right here in Westminster. Yeah, so a, a bit of a theme occurring at the moment is the problems we're having with our reliance on Chinese technology. And we uncovered in January that a government fleet of vehicles had been forensically swept in search for hidden Chinese tracking devices. And we know that, you know, at least one car was found to have these devices in them. As well as that, we've been looking at the way Hong Kong dissidents in the UK are being treated and followed, harassed, and sometimes even mugged by people they suspect to be Chinese state actors. We've spoken to many intelligence sources about that, and they say it's part of the playbook for state harassment and hostility. And so we continue to work on this issue as it becomes in the forefront of the public interest about our reliance on Chinese technology and the way in which we've been quite dormant on this issue for for decades and how in light of the war, growing tensions with China, that dominance in the market for China could come back and bite us. In terms of, you know, beyond China and Russia, who are the names which come up so often when we talk about spying and espionage? Are there any other states which maybe we're overlooking with our focus on those two? One state that's quickly becoming in the forefront of the intelligence community's eyes is is Iran. Um, Mm. We've seen recent weeks and months. Iranian media organizations don't feel safe to even have bases in the UK anymore because of the level of um, activity through Iranian um, espionage. That's a slowly burning threat under the surface, which, which has the potential to spike quite quickly. And I mean, you know, looking at the the number of threats we're, we're currently trying to monitor and look at, it's going to be quite easy for someone to swoop in under the radar. The intelligence community has got their hands pretty, pretty full at the moment. Let's head back to Chris and hear what he has to say about the differences between these threats. I think there's a cultural and traditional issue here, historical, in that Russia has always put a lot of resource, the best people it can recruit, and a lot of political power behind its intelligence operations and intelligence services as a priority of statecraft, which I don't think is the case in in China to that extent. And of course, the other thing is that certainly China and arguably Iran, but certainly China, have greater equities in having relatively smooth relations with Britain and with the West because they seek to gain things through conventional diplomacy and conventional interaction. I think Russia is now well beyond the pale on all that. When we're now seeing the war in Ukraine bringing a closer relationship for China and Russia and almost forcing China to pick its allegiances in that matter, how worrying is the alliance between Russia and China for the West, do you think? I think in strategic terms, it's quite concerning in that they seem to have a a mutual interest in opposing democracy, the rule of law, and you know, free international trade and everything else. I think actually, ironically, in the intelligence sphere, my impression has always been that they are both are very xenophobic and distrusting of intelligence, uh, liaison as we call it. And I don't think there will be extensive intelligence cooperation going on between Russia and China anytime soon. And, you know, when you consider their real interests in the world, they might have some mutual interest, a com- common enemy, if you like, But they also have conflicting interests. And if you look at a country like India, for example, which Russia has been fairly allied to in the past and China's been allied to Pakistan, then clearly you've you've got them lining up in different different sides there. Their mutual interests are probably stronger in other areas, actually, than intelligence gathering or intelligence operations. And do you think that fact that China is is still a sort of peer on the international level whereas Russia is more of an aggressive, hostile state that makes Russia more of an immediate and increased threat to the UK rather than the Chinese state does. 
Yes, I mean, they're both a threat in different ways. They both fundamentally oppose to our way of life and our rule of law. And of course, when I say rule of law, I also mean things like intellectual property laws and such like technology related laws. So I think they, they both are a threat to us. I think possibly China will become more aggressive in the sort of slipstream of Russia because you know, the, the bar has been raised in terms of hostility to the West and our way of life. But the thing to remember as well is that Chinese wealth depends really on economic integration with the world market and Western markets upon which the power and stability of the Communist Party depends. And that is certainly now very different from Russia, which has kind of almost abandoned large tracts of the rich developed world in terms of economic partnership and trade. We always talk about Westminster or, or our ministers when we talk about threats from, from hostile states. And, you know, there've been some famous examples in the past with, you know, Chinese espionage infiltrating parliament or Russian money ending up in the coffers of political parties. Who do you see it at the moment in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, most capable of pulling off an espionage operation or attack on our government? I think they're both capable of doing it. I think at the moment, Russia has to do it quite covertly because their kind of acolytes and their supporters and the people they've corrupted have had to crawl back under their stones. The arguments for engagement with Russia now are pretty well discredited as a result of its conduct in Ukraine in particular. I think China has a, a greater scope in that. I mean, I, I think China is very conscious that whilst we were partly dependent on Russia for energy and so on, that actually we are pretty dependent on China as a market for our industrial base and our wealth base. These are things that are very fundamental and glue us to China in a way that we've managed, surprisingly maybe, but quite successfully in the last year, to wean ourselves off various dependencies on Russia in particular, on Russian energy. I don't see that happening as easily with China. It's an economy that's 10 times the size of Russia's and 10 times more powerful. It's no secret that Russian oligarchs have used London as a, as a sort of playground for many years, so much so that it's been nicknamed Londongrad due to the openness the city has been to Russian money. Obviously, after the war, we've seen, I think, nine waves of sanctions coming down on Russian individuals and entities. But I'm a skeptic about to what level we click our fingers and Russia's influence leaves the UK. I mean, do you think enough has been done at the moment in terms of law enforcement and combating Russian money coming into the, into the UK? Or do you think there's still more there that needs to be worked on? I think the problem is that a lot of the money has already been laundered into the UK, into UK institutions, UK banks, and so on. And I think two things there. One is that the banking system itself, the regulatory system itself, I think is still weak and not fit for purpose. The number of suspicious activity reports that are submitted are limited. Some of the worst actors are still able to bring their money on shore here in recent years. There was a case, I think, involving Semyon Logilevich, one of the most notorious members of Russian organized crime community, for example. But we have an additional problem in this country of offshore tax haven entities like the BVI, Isle of Man, the Channel Islands, and so on, where opacity is built into the business model. And that is the one really where the Russians and others have been able to exploit weaknesses in the system and maintain anonymity, sanctions evade, launder money, launder the proceeds of crime. We are nowhere near at the moment, sadly, clamping down on some of these offshore entities that we are judicially and politically responsible for. This is, you know, at the peak of the world economy. This, this is the main focus of criminal money that's circulating in the world today. What more can the UK do to get close to that point where we are sort of nipping this in the bud and, and really cracking down on, on this dirty money? We have to reform the legal systems and financial systems of our offshore entities. Now, some would argue the money will go elsewhere, well, fine, but you know, we need to clean our own house first yeah. for criticizing others. Yeah, That's pretty fundamental, I think. The other thing we need to look at is the use of proxies, new legislation relating to proxies. What's happened in many cases since February last year is simply that sanctioned individuals have managed to pass assets in a pretty obviously dishonest way to their proxies, whether they're 
Westerners or their own children and relatives. And I think that's something where we're well behind the curve. America's done that. And I mentioned earlier that we need a Foreign Agent Registration Act in this country. And we also need a more comprehensive lobbying law, in my view, along the lines, again, of what happens in America, which, which makes it criminally punishable not to be a declared lobbyist or an undeclared proxy of a target individual. It does seem crazy that we still don't have a foreign agent registration here. I can't think why that would be. The government has promised one, but it's been promising one for years. And I think, you know, politics is a matter of priorities. And I just don't think that despite the war, that some of these issues have been correctly prioritized. And we saw recently the granting of legal licenses almost automatically to various Russians who had been sanctioned in the last year. I mean, it's, it's, it's off the scale in terms of its naivety and its dysfunctionality. We're actually undermining our own policies by allowing that to happen. Richard, we've talked about the threats from states around the world here in the UK, but we're certainly no stranger ourselves to spying in other countries. What kind of institutions and capabilities are we playing with here in the UK? Yeah, I mean, look, we're certainly obviously going to be active. We've got a a reputation on a global scale of having a very well-tuned intelligence agency, a foreign-focused one in in MI6. And no doubt there'll be a hell of a lot of operations and activities going on, especially involving what's going on in Ukraine and and the current threats from China and, and other states like Iran. But to be honest with you, I've been fascinated with what's going on on our side for a long time and I found unpicking it incredibly difficult to the point where I, I, I have been able to find out very little probably for obvious reasons because my sources will be protecting those secrets but yeah I mean it, it's something I'm keen to find more out about. And in terms of the institutions that we have here there's lots of different names I can't tell you what all of them do can you give us a brief run through? Sure. I mean, the the UK intelligence community is well established, has been running for a hell of a long time. You've got three main pillars, really, in the intelligence scene in the UK. And you've got GCHQ, which specialises in gaining intelligence through communications. MI5, who are domestic focused and looking at issues and threats within the UK borders and territories. And then you've got MI6, which is our foreign agency, looking at threats outside the UK, abroad, and looking to gather intelligence from those those places. And all together, they, they work, or try to work, pretty collectively in unison. They've been working on their communication between each other for a long time, but I think, you know, nothing like a war to stir things up and, and get them working a bit harder. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure we'll have you back on before too long to pick your brains and that of all of your multitude of sources. Thank you for having me. You can read more of Richard's work from reporting on Russian dirty money in the UK to exposing hidden Chinese tracking devices in UK government cars at inews.co.uk. You'll also find breaking news, in-depth features and insightful political analysis from our team of award-winning writers. That's all from us this week. I'm Molly Blackall. You can follow me on Twitter at Molly Blackall and on Instagram at molly.blackall. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.